España es aire, aire y sol. 1, 2, 3, 30, 300 días de sol al año. Y campos y mares. Y un ancho océano. España es tierra de molinos que doman el viento. Desde siempre, nación de viento, sol, de tierra ancha y aguas profundas. Un país de energía inagotable que apuesta por desplegar sus recursos naturales para acelerar la transición ecológica y crecer de forma sostenible y descarbonizada gracias a ese potencial privilegiado. Somos el octavo país con mayor potencia renovable instalada y el segundo en Europa. Casi la mitad de la generación eléctrica nacional ya es renovable. Un sector con más de 111.000 empleos que se triplicarán en esta década. Y ya somos el décimo mercado más atractivo en el mundo para inversiones en energía verde. En el nuevo modelo energético que destierra los combustibles fósiles, el ciudadano se erige en actor principal. En España el autoconsumo se ha multiplicado por 10 desde 2017 y el mapa de las comunidades energéticas crece cada día. España ha situado el clima y la energía en el centro de una transformación integral para lograr la neutralidad climática en 2050. Una economía de bajas emisiones competitiva y eficiente que asegure la soberanía energética con recursos limpios y propios y garantice la protección de los hogares. Esta transición debe ser justa con las personas y los territorios. La premisa es no dejar a nadie atrás, creando alternativas innovadoras, manteniendo el empleo y la población con inversiones ligadas a la economía verde, con diálogo y participación ciudadana. En este camino a la descarbonización, Spiric 23 arranca como foro para crear sinergias y sumar voces de alto nivel al debate de cómo encajar las piezas en el diseño del futuro energético, para ahondar juntos en este reto común con un diálogo constructivo y pleno de aciertos. El mundo nos está mirando. Muy buenos días. Good morning, all. Good morning, good morning. I'm happy to welcome all of you to this international conference. Renewables is what we're going to talk about. Warmly welcome to this international conference for renewable energies. España estábamos viendo. España. Spain, Spain, a country as we know that enjoys all of these natural resources that we have seen reflected in this video. The variety is just astounding. Sun, land, wind, rivers, a country of millions of citizens, millions of citizens who live and feel the resources that this wonderful land has to offer and who want to live in healthier and more sustainable settings, in cleaner settings, at the end of the day, more people friendly. Spain, Madrid, the capital of our country is the capital, the global capital of renewables. And thus today we have the world's salient leaders. And I'm going to now give them a cordial uh, welcome. Beginning, of course, with His Excellency Pedro Sanchez. Good morning, sir. Also the VP Minister for Ecological Transition, Teresa Rivera. Good morning, ma'am. The President of REM21, Arturo Servos as you know, coordinates this uh, conference together with uh, the government of Spain. Kadri Simpson, Energy, good morning. The director of health of the WHO, Maria, good morning. The director general of IRENA, Renewable Energies, Francesco La Camera, Ministers of Energy from the Netherlands, Romania, Secretaries of State, authorities, thank you all, thank you all for being with us, for spending time with us. I bid you, as I said before, a very cordial welcome. It's very important to have a session such as this. As a Spaniard, I have to say I'm very proud that this conference actually is being hosted here by Spain. Now, we have representatives from the world over. These are persons who are very busy, and we thank them for doing so, but it gives us an understanding of how very important this uh, session is. As we saw in our video, the world, indeed, 
has its eyes on us. Right now, this minute, Spain is a beacon, if you will, of this debate, the transformation which is underway and the transformation which must take into account persons and territories. Now, people, we saw this in the presentation. Persons and people must be the hub of this activity, a substitution of fossil fuels by green energies. We're going to be talking specifically about renewables for people, renewables, but for people, for persons, for men and women. After the very difficult couple of years that have just gone by, after the more recent REN21, Seoul 19, the IRIC International Renewable Energy Conferences have selected Spain, Spain at the cutting edge of this energy transition in Spain, in Europe, and the world over. And Spain is doing so in an ambitious way. Climate, energy, citizens are at the very heart of public policies as an engine for a true overhaul. And thus, we have designed a regulatory framework with multiple strategies and roadmaps with legislation which is already in force and which actually provides us with the kind of a backbone that will withstand this transition. I now, as I said, I'm very happy to bid a cordial welcome to Mr. Pedro Sanchez, the president of the government of Spain, to join me here and officially inaugurate, officially open this conference. Sir, you have the floor. Good morning, sir. Good morning, and thank you all very much, Lorenzo Mila. You know, I think it is important that leaders, opinion leaders, be committed to this revolution, to this transition, which must perforce think of people first. Dear Teresa VP, dear Kadri Simpson, dear Friends, Rob, friend from Romania, Virgil, president of REN21, dear friends, all. You know, we usually say that we are the last generation which will be able to actually offset the devastating effects, and we have the toolkit that we need to do so. Among all of those tools, I believe the most potent one is a decisive commitment, a true engagement by citizens, no holds barred, for the deployment of renewables, clean energies, which is why we are here to talk about today. Sun, wind, abundant, fortunately, in our country, in Spain, and at the same time, the essential elements of our collective identity as a country. So from this vantage point, what the government of Spain wants to achieve, and many regions and many public entities and institutions for renewables, is at the service of a logic which is so obvious and which looks at our own true natural resources. Now, this was not as obvious in the past, perhaps, those who fostered other measures, measures that were not the best ones in a recent past, the tax on sunlight, retractive uh, elements on renewables and obstacles to renewables. This was harmful for a sector which has truly become absolutely crucial when we think about mitigating the effects and when we think also of re-industrialization of our country. The future of Spain is at stake here. So where would we be today had we taken advantage of all of those years? But because we cannot turn the clock back, I think that it makes sense to not waste time crying over spilt milk by others in the past. In just five years' time, we have recovered, I think, that time that was lost. We have established the bases to ensure that our country really be an international 
stakeholder in the field of renewables. So today we can say, and we can say it clearly, that we matter, that we are respected, that we are worthy leaders the Vice President III and Minister for uh, Transition, Teresa Rivera. So today, we stride forward. Our commitment is to a transition which must be fair and equitable based on renewables and their tremendous potential. And this not only because we need to be autonomous, no, no, but because we want to evolve towards a green economy which will create more and better jobs and which will definitely wager on technological innovation. When we talk about renewables at the end of the day, we're talking about quality jobs. Just a couple of numbers here. The commitments that we reached when we talk about climate, the International Energy Agency forecast that in the world of transition, the jobs will go from 6 million today to 14, 14 million jobs by the year 2030. If we see total jobs created, advancing towards being carbon neutral will create between 33 million to 70, 70 million jobs from 2021 to 2030. So think about how we're going to be offsetting jobs lost in the field of jobs related to fossil fuel activity and energy. In our country then, we will be all that much more successful if we leap ahead of the competition. Renewables, 111 million jobs direct or indirect, so an increase of 20% if we compare with 2020, which has our country ranking third in the European Union with most jobs that are directly linked to renewable energies. Jobs were created in different technologies, PV, wind, solar, thermoelectric, marine, but I think that it's PV that calls our attention, which has grown by 59% in terms of job creation from one year to the next, 59%. So the potential is just staggering. And the sector could actually create up to 468,000 jobs in Spain in the upcoming 10 years if we continue to back renewables and perhaps more specifically Photovoltaic. So it's not only installation and services. No, no. We're talking about reindustrializing, kickstarting our country. We are poised to build 99 percent of the components for a wind project and 65 percent for a PV project. In other words, when we talk about strategic autonomy of Europe, which of course has got to be open, we're talking about how we can produce in Europe all of the capacities that will allow us to truly transition to green. So these data in hand allow us to prove that yes, we can kickstart the industrialization of services in our country, this green transition, which is so important for Spain and for the Union. At this point in time, we export more value added in PV and wind than in many other products which are very specific to our country, such as, for instance, oil or wine. So to summarize, over 100,000 jobs depend now, now, on renewables in Spain, and it is calculated that it could well be half a million jobs in the next decade. Quality jobs, which will call for qualified, for skilled manpower, and thus tomorrow we are going to approve in the Council of Ministers the most abundant um, number of uh, grants, 2.5 billion, to foster the employability of our youth in order to encourage activities within the green, or transition rather, to the green sector. And thus, we look at vocational training. Today, I saw in the media how important professional vocation skilling is. We need to have more alternatives, and we need to foster this by creating 20,000 places available in training centers that look at transition. We will be creating these 20,000 positions linked to these very important sectors. So what I mean to say is we need to be very clear. The government is very 
clear-sighted. We are going to truly leverage this opportunity granted to us by the transition to create more and better jobs and to keep Spain on the cutting edge in this transition. We are, as I said before, deploying Lorenzo Milá said it also. We're looking at this roadmap, despite the fact that, yes, this geopolitical map is a complex one. This week, we're going to be commemorating the first anniversary of uh, Putin's war on the Ukraine. But there's also other factors that need to be taken into account, which are reasons that would encourage us to advance along the uh, road towards green transition. Climate emergency, the World Economic Forum, we've heard many other times, lets us know that in the upcoming two years, five of the leading 10 threats to economic development globally are directly linked to the environment and therefore to climate change. Secondly, as we said before, Russia's war on Ukraine, and third, climate dependency. The Ukrainian conflict brings to mind up to what point up to what point renewable energies are a factor that guarantees global stability and energy that is related to fossil fuels encourage instability. Eight of every 10 inhabitants of the world live in countries that are net importers of energy. So in this uh, setting, creating a new framework would imply advancing towards a more fair and equitable world order defined by an open economy and ensuring that there is the possibility of avoiding energy blackmail, which is, of course, what we've seen over this very long 12 months of the war in the Ukraine. Steps had never been taken as decisively by our country as they have been taken now. Energy and decarbonization have grown by 360% globally, so we are witness to the new industrial revolution in which leading clean energy technology is going to times three their current value in barely seven years, and the year 2050 will be the year of, carbon, of being carbon neutral. The European Union and our country have committed to this. The weight of um, fossil fuels is going to shrink dramatically from 1990% to 1818% from that uh, total volume. I think that these numbers are very telling. In political terms, they speak of the fact that we have socially vanquished, politically vanquished the negationists, the naysayers, those who deny the existence of, uh, of this emergency. But we still face other types of naysaying, which is much more subtle, which is the one that is um, carried out by those who do not deny the evidence. They're, they're not denialists as such, but they deny the degree of change that is necessary. So we see the war, and some defend that we should postpone energy transition until we overcome the current emergency. And maybe we need to look for safeguard solutions. Well, I have to say that in Spain, I, I am absolutely convinced we are not there. The responses that Spain is given to this energy crisis are fully aligned with that response to the climate emergency because we believe that the attitude that I described before is a mistaken one. As I say, what we want to do is stride forward towards that green transition. We want to leverage these difficult times from a geopolitical point of view as a spur which will have us doing more and faster. And so we are going to defend that vision. We're going to be presiding the council as of next July. And we will be defining energy transition as an absolute priority with a capital P for the Spanish presidency as it is for the sum total of the union. Spain has taken very important steps towards this objective. And there are two basic premises that I need to share with you. First, ensure that vulnerability is less and the costs associated to our traditional energy dependency. And secondly, leverage this overhaul as a means, as I said before, to kickstart the industry in our territory. This is one 
of the specifics of this Green Revolution, seeing how territories that have been left behind during previous industrial revolutions are now taking center stage. I'm thinking, for instance, about Extremadura, Andalusia. I'm thinking about many other parts of the country, Castile León. I'm thinking about how we are kickstarting the industry of Spain in parts of the country that in the past had been left on the sidelines. So we're growing competitiveness of our enterprises, of our companies, where we do have those mirrors to look into. So I think that we are resilient, we're solid, we are looking forward to leaving uncertainties behind. Just last week, the Commission said that it had higher hopes for our Spanish economy in 23. Our economy will, in theory, be growing more than the average in the European Union. In terms of job creation, last year, 22, we had the lowest degree of unemployment in the past 14 years. The forecast is good. And this is thanks to the agreement reached with stakeholders regarding the temporary nature of uh, contracts, which is, of course, an issue that we um, have to face in our, in our job market. So what I mean to say, ladies and gentlemen, is that these numbers would not be possible without the very real impact of structural reforms, which are encouraged and which are deep, I would add, in the field of energy and in the field of renewables. Before, I made a reference to the legal framework, legislation on climate change, our national plan for climate, decarbonization in the long term. These are very telling examples, and the results are there for all to see. We rank now eighth in the world in terms of installed power, installed energy. We're number two in Europe, and over the past two years, we have set records regarding solar panel installation, and we have uh, multiplied by two self-consumption. We are the eighth most interesting market for green energy. And a little bit more information, in 2022, renewables represented 42% of energy generated in our country. We surpassed wind and nuclear in terms of and electricity. We produce 27% more wind than in 18, and 300% more PV if we compare with the same year back in 2018. And uh, let me just add the icing to the cake. We manufactured 990% of the components for wind. We are the third exporter in the world of aero generators, and we export 660% of photovoltaic. So Spain has been able to face the crisis much better poised than other European partners who depend more on fossil fuels and especially those of Russian origin. And this helps us understand also that the Iberian solution will be successful, a desire to reform the electric market. We talked about the need to reform the uh, electric market. Our solution then allows us to reduce the amounts paid by consumers in just 12 months by about 50. We have saved 5 billion euros with the estimate of 600 million of additional savings every month for the rest of the year. And especially affecting the pockets of your average citizen. So the executive is pleased to see that we are poised to be a reference to a fully decarbonized model. And I believe that this is our credential if we are to continue to advance along these lines. Firstly, hydrogen, renewable hydrogen. We are placing our bets on a sector which is going to weigh 35% of uh, world trade by 2050. Our resources, 8.9 billion euros, public and private investments in our roadmap looking at green hydrogen, 6.9 billion for the strategic project renewables, hydrogen and storage, 
within the recovery plan. This is an amount that we're going to grow until we arrive at the number of 10 billion euros. This is what we're currently negotiating with the European Commission. And by the way, nearly four of every 10 euros of each uh, one of these uh, subsidies goes to transition. There's essential infrastructure. The media is aware of that corridor, the European hydrogen corridor, Acidosmed, which we work with France and Portugal and Germany. We're all working together to supply the European Union with 10% of its hydrogen need. And the fifth part of investments in green hydrogen are concentrated here in Spain. And what's more, 20% of the 5.2 billion euros of public subsidies approved by the Commission, seven of the 35 projects from the IPCI, as you know, these are the uh, projects of which uh, target industrial activities. That's going to be very important because we'd have to add an additional four of the IPCI, those first four projects, that is for the recovery plan. So green hydrogen, one. Two, we saw it in the video, wind, sea base or marine, which in 2040 is going to represent half of the installed wind energy in Europe. And there again, we have a roadmap to develop everything involved, anything related to seas, and oceans, we want our country there again to be at the head of the game. We want to foster this growth sustainably from an environmental and social point of view. How could it be otherwise? Spain, of course, benefits from tremendous advantages because we have 6,000 kilometers of coastline, 6,000 kilometers of shore. I think that we are Europe's number one in terms of coastline. So wind, on land is also important. This explains that we do have a head start, a very important head start, when we think about uh, developing the scope of this industry. And finally, storage. The government of Spain believes that storage is absolutely crucial. We are talking about guaranteeing quality supplies. We are committed to 20 gigabots in 2030 and 30 gigawatts in the year 2050. And finally, and this I think is also very important, is the transformation of the industrial sector. That would be the automobile sector. We're focusing on that and we're pushing the development of an electric vehicle and we're being successful so far. There are 10 major projects that include two battery plants that have already been spoken about. Let me conclude. I shared numbers with you. I shared these facts with you because I want to base my thoughts on facts. We go beyond the political speech. We go beyond anything we could say. I think that for Spain right now, when we talk about transición energética, the energy transition, this goes hand in hand with a word that our third vice president likes to refer to, which is justa, fair, equitable, just. Because we're talking about the lives of people. And this is part of the propaganda of those whose vested interests reside in nothing changing. And now, at this point in time, when we need to tackle something which is very similar to the major industrial revolutions of the past, now is when we need to roll up our sleeves in order to ensure that this transition be justa, equitable, fair, just, which is why for the government it's important to make sure that no one is left behind, that this revolution is good for all, good for all persons, good for all people, good for all the territories, good for all the regions. These are times of change, and new opportunities accompany these changes. The creation of jobs, sustainable growth that will ensure that we strike a balance which we aim to achieve, the growth of each one of the regions of our country. We need to take advantage of this. This is an economic must and a moral must. We need to grow and help people be where they should be. I think that this is a moral imperative. This is the framework around which this conference gyrates. 
top-notch global experts have turned Madrid this week into the world capital of renewables. I welcome you to this wonderful city, and I agree with you. The priority is to make sure that there is no one left behind. I encourage all of you, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage all of you to continue to work hard. Spain legitimately wants to lead, setting an example, walking the talk, ensuring that renewables are what they must be. In the certainty that the best way you can achieve a more equitable world is by placing our trust in renewables. So again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Madrid, welcome to the conference, and good luck. Good luck. Your debates, your contributions will be essential for our activities to be carried out. Thank you very much. After the intervention of uh, the President of the Government of Spain, Pedro Sánchez, we declare officially opened this uh, conference, SPIREC 23. And now, within a few minutes, we will start the first session of this international meeting. We ask you for the, to stay here during those co the coming three, four minutes, because we will uh, start again. We will reconvene again immediately.
Well, we will reconvene. We are going to listen to the first block of panels today. In order to introduce this first session of a very high level, I invite to the stage Arturo Cervos, president of REN21, as co-organizer of this meeting, together with the government of Spain. Please, Mr. Cervos. Thank you. Thank you very much. So good morning, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Friend 21, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you for SPIREC 2023. And on behalf of Friend 21, I would like also to thank the Spanish government, most especially the Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, who came and inaugurated this, uh, this conference, Teresa Rivera, Deputy Prime Minister for the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge of Spain, Sara Agesen, I hope that is the name more, more or less so correctly. Secretary of State of Energy, Ministry of the Ecological Transition and Demographic Challenge of Spain. And also Joan Groazar, Director General of IDAE, for co-hosting SPIREC 23 and struggling to arrive here all together. As someone who has been actively engaged in renewables for decades, I can sa safely say we have come a long way. The discussions have significantly matured over the years. From a strict conversation about power to deep consideration of energy, from limited interventions to strategies that are accelerating renewable energy deployment. We also have succeeded in moving energy demand to the center of the debate developing the economic sector, and propelling renewables to the core of societal activity. I'm particularly pleased that we, as the global renewable energy community, are coming together, united with the same sense of urgency. In these particularly challenging times, we need to ensure that the global new energy order we are shaping is centered around renewable energy. I'm also pleased that we are organizing this conference in Spain, one of the pioneering countries in Europe. We heard from the Prime Minister, I'm sure that we will hear more from the Vice Prime Minister afterwards. There is no better moment, not better place, to convene such a distinguished multi-stakeholder assembly of change makers. Europe has been one of the historic leaders in the energy transition. It can offer the world tremendous learning from its pioneering experience. The EU was the forerunner with its 1997 white paper and the first EU directive on renewables in 2001. More recently, the EU has responded to the global crisis by continuously raising the broadening their renewable energy ambition and action. And I'm sure that we'll hear more about that from the commissioner right afterwards. In 2004, the Renewables Conference in Bonn, in Germany, started the International Renewable Energy Conference series, also launching internationally, internationally a multi-stakeholder policy dialogue on renewable energy and prompting the creation of REN21. Today, the continent is trying to turn the current challenges into opportunities and completely transform its energy system and build a prosperous, renewable-based economy and society. But regional strategies are not enough to address global challenges. We need global collective actions to resolve global issues. We need to ensure 
that renewables are at the heart of our climate and development action to reboot the world. We are certainly going through extraordinary times, punctuated by compounding crises. The COVID-19 pandemic wiped out more than four years of progress on poverty alleviation and pushed more than 93 million people into extreme poverty in 2020. The climate crisis has reached dangerous levels with global temperature crossing one degree Celsius pre-industrial levels, causing devastating impacts across the world. These crises have been aggravated by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has worsened supply chain interruptions and energy insecurity. These multiple emergencies have been disruptive beyond the energy sector. We are seeing paradigm effects from globalization to deglobalization, from free markets to state intervention, as well as significant geopolitical changes. These disruptions create both opportunities and challenges. There was an abrupt awakening that accelerated the energy transition. More players are recognizing the role of renewables in enabling sustainable economic development and addressing energy security. The potential of renewable energy to build manufacturing, develop industry, and skilling people is also increasingly recognized. Renewables bring immense long-term benefits to the table. Clean air and water, more reliable and resilient energy supply, sustainable energy access, and protection from climate change. With the right regulatory framework, renewable energy also enables diverse players, including citizens, cities, and regions, to produce their own energy and engage actively in the energy game anywhere in the world. This is a chance to redistribute economic power and wealth. And still, there is a long way to go. We continue to use fossil fuels to cover more than 80% of our total final energy consumption. And some sectors, in particular heating and cooling in buildings and industry, as well as tra transport, lag behind even more. A rich, a renewable energy share of 11 and even 4% only, respectively. Furthermore, progress achieved has been undermined by short-sightedness and spontaneous non-strategic responses to the recent energy crisis. Many governments have turned to all the recipes tainted with fossil fuel to address the energy crisis. As a result, 2022 marked the highest levels of coal consumption. Fossil fuel subsidies doubled and investment in natural gas infrastructure spiked. This situation has also led to deepening inequalities Profits of the five major oil and gas companies have skyrocketed, as have the incomes of the fossil fuel producing and exporting countries. Simultaneously, fossil fuel dependent countries have to use an increasing amount of their national expenditure to ensure their energy supply. Millions of people are facing energy poverty. In 2022, for the first time in decades, the number of people without access to electricity has increased. In the current situation, finding the balance between energy security, energy equity and affordability, and environmental sustainability is even more challenging. We have the solutions to respond to the global crisis. Energy efficiency and renewable energy need to be at the heart of our actions. They build a more resilient, equitable and inclusive society. The reality is that these solutions are not enough. We need deep structural transformations to end the production and use of fossil fuels, to transform the fossil fuel era into a renewable energy era. But deep transformations require focus, political will, determination, and strategic leadership. We need to avoid being sidetracked from set ambitious goals. Failing to address the climate crisis threatens humanity. We cannot afford to be on the wrong side of history and fail entire generations 
by prioritizing geopolitics, national interests, and greed over sustainable development and environmental protection. Past, present, and future are connected. This is the moment when we shape our future. We need to put renewables at the heart of our climate and development actions to reboot the world now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Savros, and thank you as well for these words that also will help to frame the debate. This first session of a high level will f that will start soon will be focused on what are the main challenges of this transition process, a tra an energy transition in a very complex setting in a world as the current one with multiple simultaneous crises. And what does all this mean in order to reach the 2030 goals? In order to do that, we have the presence of some of the le international most important leaders in this debate, in this energy debate at the worldwide level. Among them, the Vice President Rivera, the um, Commissioner Kadri Simpson, and the General Director of the Energy, Francesco La Camera. This panel will be moderated by the sociologist and politologist expert in social movements and cl climate emergency and ecological transition, Cristina Mochet. I ask them, to please, to take their seats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo Mila. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, to moderate this panel with three of the most relevant people to energy transition in Spain and Europe and in the world. Welcome and good morning for everyone. See uh, in Europe key people bird. to address the main challenge Europe and the world is facing now. Staying the curves and accelerate the speed and ambition on energy transition in a context of war, a war in Ukraine. It is no easy, but there is not alternative. There is not another option. I would like to welcome and give the floor to the third vice president of the government of Spain, Minister for the Ecological Transition, Teresa Rivera. Good morning. Mrs. Rivera, a pleasure having you here. Congratulations for holding this meeting here of IRENA here in Madrid. That places Spain in a very important point with a very great responsibility for the development of renewable energies. And I would like to start with a very specific question. Uh, Spain has had a successful model in incorporating renewables and in the management of everything that has been meant by the energy crisis in Europe as to prices is concerned. This is due to a policy of thrust for renewables and the I-billion mechanism that has allowed us to better manage the prices of energy. What are the choices that we can draw from what Spain has lived this year, and especially what are the structural reforms that are still pending for the future? Thank you, Cristina. Maybe I would like to start thanking as well This is maybe what we have tried to be working on from the Spanish perspective. And I introduce a few of the elements. I point out some of the elements that have been outlined by um, our President Sanchez. We were wor wor working with the transit conviction that the transformation of the energy sector was an important point in the agenda from the point of view of energy, but also from economy and industry, with very interesting opportunities in innovation, in employment, in modernization of our industrial system. It is also an agenda for peace. It's very striking how many people in the world who depend 
on a few products that are located in a few cu countries, whilst renewable energies allow us to generalize that model in many more places without uh, forcing any dependencies that are not always are easy to solve. We had been working at the national level, and in year 2021-22, with that crisis, this tension, this uh, polarization, we have activated different measures, regulatory measures and tax measures of social coverage as well, enabling from the administrative point of view in order to accelerate the deployment of renewable energies and the transformation of a model based on efficiency, more renewables, and more uh, decarbonization of the whole of the economy. We have worked with our colleagues in Europe. Some of them are here today with us. We have made a collective exercise that have been very respectful and satisfactory as well to answer all together to a great to respond to a great threat, respecting and looking for solutions that will allow us that all with a different history could be able to contribute to the collective response. Uh, it's a European pro construction project that is very interesting around the transformation of the energy system. We believe that anyhow, beyond that social support and that regulatory support that can be done from each one of the member states, the administrative support of infrastructures and logistics and personal capacitation and personal capacitation as well, there are settings where the response at the European level is much more efficient. And in that setting, I think that some of the questions that maybe would have come later have already come. How can we give stability to the system, regulating, enabling, storage, availability? How can we do out of this uh, an industrial venture for Europe as innovation? How can we think what are the questions that the current regulation of the markets uh, does, is unable to answer yet because the, a lot of time has elapsed and it has been successful. But the reality in the coming years is not the same as the reality of the past years. And I think this is an agenda that is going to show throughout the next months. And I'm convinced that it, they will do that in a very constructive manner, looking again how to uh, add the effort of everybody and how to contribute from the experience of each one of us the best options. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rivera. Then we will go over with that. Um, then I would like to thank you. Thank you for participating in this conference. In response to the energy crisis, the European Union decided to accelerate green transition, energy transition, with the power, the power plan, the power and European plan. What do you feel are the key challenges and risks for the for the future and for the present too in 2023 and beyond. Thank you for the question and good morning, everybody. I actually was thinking back when I was last time here in Madrid, and uh, and this was exactly a year ago, three days before Russia started its uh, unjustified war against uh, Ukraine. But this was already the time when we faced um, exceptionally high energy prices due to the fact that Russia had dominant position in our energy markets, and they manipulated with their gas storage. They bet um, on our vulnerability, and they will try to divide us. We, on the contrary, decided that solidarity is the best response, and uh, already in March, the uh, European Commission presented Repower EU plan, how to get rid of uh, Russian gas. And um, this was not a simple and easy task, Teresa can uh, confirm my message. Uh, last year, it was an extraordinary year for energy <laughs> ministers and commission. Um, All together, we met 12 times. Um, this is an uh, unseen uh, sequence for energy ministers to meet. We adopted five extraordinary packages. And uh, step by step, I think we uh, managed to stabilize uh, the situation here in Europe. Um, but already in March, we knew that it will be impossible to replace all the Russian gas volumes with alternative suppliers. The share of Russian gas in our energy mix was just too big. And just last week, <coughs> uh, Russian Minister Novak presented numbers for Russia and Russian production uh, volumes. And uh, based on that, we knew that they cut their production almost by 90 billion cubic meters. So from some 762 in 2021 down to 673. And that means that they created a very dense situation at global markets. 
so they were not able to sell this cash to nobody else because they had no alternative pipeline connections. Um, and um, if we had to replace some of our gas with imported uh, fossil fuels, this well created deficit in other regions. So that's why we prioritized energy savings. And um, if you tend to think that at EU level, the decision making takes a lot of time, then this was only five days effort when member states in the middle of July were able to agree that we will cut our gas consumption, and we did. So agreement was made in July, and I can tell you that between August until January, compared to the previous five-year average, EU 27 member states cut their consumption by 19%, almost 42 billion cubic meters. And I think that uh, this is necessary effort because uh, we don't want to create um, difficulties to the other global regions, but this is also effort where all our like-minded partners can also support us, being them in Japan, well, Japan is very, very supportive. They are also seeking for uh, <coughs> alternatives, how to cut to their ga gas consumption. Uh, well, in Latin America, or, or even for Egypt, for example, they are cutting their gas consumption, replacing it by renewables, and by doing so, they can ease the global, uh, global situation. And then, of course, last year was an extraordinary year for renewables in Europe. So, um, more than 55 gigawatts new installations connected to our grid, um, up by 40%. And this year we have to, well, even, um, even do better. So preparation for next winter started already yesterday. Mm -hmm. If our storage stays full, <coughs> if our um, patterns, how we consume, will be more energy efficient, and if we will promote renewables, um, we will get through next winter too. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. We are going to uh, to make it with uh, European uh, challenges and, and key factors later. But now I would like to to welcome to Francesco La Camera, La Camera, <laughs> sorry, Francesco La Camera, General Director for Airena. Um, Mr. La Camera, uh, last year the world uh, faced a um, poly crisis. Countries uh, around the world. Uh, have had to cope with an energy security, uh, inflationary processes, and both of them in the context of a climate emergency. So, um, has the ongoing crisis, has the ongoing energy crisis acted as a setback or a catalyzer for energy transition? What do you think about this? So, first of all, thanks for, uh, for the invitation to be here. And thanks for your question. Uh, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, I'm just coming from the Munich conference uh, where this was discussed in deep. And uh, uh, the main message that I, I catch from uh, the discussion we had there is that uh, the energy security and the fighting uh, climate change, uh, in fact, are face of the same medal. Uh, Surely the medal should be not should be more articulated because also uh, moving to the transition, the just transition is one of other elements that should be considered in the, in this framework. And naturally, when we are talking about uh, the just transition, we are not just talking about uh, providing for new job for people that is going to lose their job because of the transition itself. But when we talk about the transition, we talk about a transformation. So from one world to another, in this respect, just means that we are being maybe able to eliminate or decrease the inequality that still exists in the, in the world. And uh, if one of these phases of uh, this uh, articulated medal, we fail, we fail on all of, uh, of this passage. So uh, where we are going and what could be the impact of the Ukrainian crisis? First of all, uh, there is no doubt where we are going. I repeat this always when I came. So we are moving to a new energy system that will be dominated largely by renewables. We are complemented by hydrogen, mainly green hydrogen, and the sustainable use of biomass. So the problem that we have is not in the direction of travel, but is on uh, the speed and the scale of this transformation. 
So what could be the impact of the crisis on uh, the speed and the scale of transformation because it could impact on the direction of travel? So naturally, we, we the, the fear, and uh, we have discussed this already 10 days, I remember after the, the, the starting of the crisis, that uh, this could be affecting in the, in the short term uh, the transition because uh, country and region will try to, to uh, find ways to, in the short term, uh, to cover the, 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 the uh, lack of supply from, uh, from, uh, from the Russia. And naturally this uh, has meant also trying to revive in some way some coal plant, uh, sometimes find other way to, 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 to have gas, and some other way has been also, uh, the European Union in particular has been able to, to make the uh, tremendous saving, so working for the, uh, for the efficiency. <coughs> in fact, the, this impact in, just in the short term negative has been mediated also by the difference in price that has been increasing because of the high price of gas. And this made uh, renewables that are already competitive more competitive also in the very short period. In the medium term, there is no doubt that uh, the, the crisis will uh, have a, a positive impact for the energy transition <coughs> in terms of uh, speed and scale. Uh, we have seen, and uh, Kadri have said, what uh, the European Union has been able to do. We have listened from the Prime Minister and Vice Prime Minister what a country uh, as uh, Spain is doing to accelerate the path to become less dependent. And we are seeing what's happening in India, in Japan, uh, and elsewhere where countries are trying to, to finally realize that they were too heavily dependent on, uh, on fossil fuel. And the only way to have a system that could be more resilient is uh, moving from a centralized energy system based on fossil fuel to a new one that is decentralized, so having more actor in, uh, into the ground to make the system uh, in, <coughs> to be more, I to say, more resilient. And we conclude, because I like to be, to be uh, brief and also a second chance for everyone, is that uh, naturally the fact that in the medium term this is going to accelerate the path <coughs> doesn't mean that we are going to be in track with the Paris Agreement uh, for the achievement of the Paris Agreement goals. We are very far from there. No listen to anyone that is say uh, differently than this because the reality is that the reality that we are going, I don't want to use the word of, uh, of uh, the Secretary General of uh, mass suicide, uh, but uh, the, our path is absolutely not in line. Uh, naturally, we uh, have much hope to COP28 that this, will be, that this will be reverted, but the COP28 will be only the COP that officially will say very clearly that we are not in track, so that the country are not fulfilling the commitment they have signed in in occasion of the Paris Agreement. But on this possibly I can come later. Thank you. Thank you very much. From centralizing to the centralizing system, maybe it's one of the key challenges for the energy revolution and for the energy transition. And also for the market of electricity, Mrs. Rivera, one of the key issues that have to do with many of these elements that we are mentioning here today is much linked to what happens with the electrical market. We know that Spain has played a fundamental role in the European Union opening this de debate. And we also know that in the month of March, the European Commission will make public the first position to see how this market is going to be reformed. How do you imagine the future an electric market that is helpful to accelerate the, the energy transition as well? This is a very bold question, having the Commissioner here. So I will just refer to some of the issues that we believe are important. I believe that, in fact, we, we are living already a transformation in which the transport networks are fundamental, prepared to be safe, to be intelligent, efficient in the distribution and accessibility and stability of the system, the combination of energies, electric energy produced outside and inside the system, the electrification of the end product is key. The stability, the quality of what is provided requires an environment that is attractive for the investors and requires a social support so that the society 
enjoys as soon as possible the benefits of this transformation. And that's why the main issue that we state is that this transformation can't be do, done at the price or the marginal cost referred to a very expensive natural gas. We have to find formulas so that the present bigger and bigger and bigger of energies with operational low costs is perceived in a positive manner by uh, people. But with the stability for the investors, there were debates on the supposed cannibalization of the system with energies that had very low operational costs. And how are we going to give stability in the mid and long-term contract with liquidity in the mid and long-term contract, but also markets, but also with profitability for the investors at the same time. We have emphasized something that the operators themselves of the transport systems in our countries, starting by the Spanish case, uh, point out, and that is that we need to guarantee through uh, markets with capacity of storage and to offer opportunities for which is the business of this availability in systems in which more and more we will have intermittent generation and that can't fail. We need electricity there where it is needed without having any sort of problem. So that's why we believe it is good to think that markets of energy can coexist and markets of capacity. And that's why we think it's good to have a design where we can incorporate auctions due to technologies in such a way that we create a space so that there is enough liquidity in the mid and long term markets and in a flexible manner as well, so that everyone can incorporate and make and can make decisions on their own, about their own electricity and it's hyped through bilateral systems or goes through the market and they do so with similar formula to the auctions that we have tested in the setting of the renewables since long. And this stability is also offered thanks to this market's capacity market. But the most important thing is that the debate that will open formally when the Commission presents its proposal, allows for a deep dialogue and a space in which uh, we all can meet, because I'm convinced that there is no, not one single government in Europe, and probably not in other places either that are not in Europe, nor not one only actor in this uh, setting that hasn't the clear idea that the goals of progressive decarbonization, stable prices, and predictable prices that is attractive for the investors and an accelerated transformation is not part of the goals of the shared goals by all of us. Thank you very much. Ms. Simpson, uh, Simpson. is key for energy transition, for grid transition in general. But um, other big question is about a green industry. Uh, currently, there is a global race in the world for uh, to attract investment in green technologies, in new industrial capacity. How can we combine a new push to our uh, industrial policy and strategic autonomy with the need to maintain a global cooperation and a resilient global supply chains? Maybe the $1 million question. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, and uh, this is such a broad question that it takes more time than we do have. <laughs> uh, but I try to be brief and cover all the um, aspects. And uh, before I do so, I would like to compliment also what uh, Teresa was uh, saying about the electricity market design, because it was only five or six years ago when we completed the discussions with member states uh, on clean energy package for all Europeans. And then we thought that now regulatory environment is ready, but, uh, well, how wrong were we? Because uh, the um, transition has been significantly faster than we predicted only a couple of years ago. Um, now we need a framework that uh, accommodates um, more renewables. And on the top of that, uh, we know that if we want to get rid of fossil fuels, imported fossil fuels, then that means that our economy will consume significantly more electricity. And that puts extra pressure to our power generation. So um, this is the core of this electricity market design, how to bring benefits of low-cost renewables to consumers. And, uh, and of course, um, there is another side, how 
um, how we will produce these uh, renewables. Um, we addressed uh, some of the bottlenecks last December with our extraordinary uh, um, legislation, uh, for example, how to shorten permitting, but uh, there is also an uh, aspect of supply change, from where will we receive uh, solar panels or windmills, um, um, do we have enough capacity to produce, for example, heat pumps that will help us mm -hmm. to replace individual gas boilers with, uh, with electrici electricity solutions, um, how we will store batteries, and then, uh, then of course, uh, also a um, question of electrolyzers. So um, you can expect that along with our electricity market design proposal in the middle of the March, we will also come out with our Green Deal industrial plan, and this will address uh, all these challenges, on top of that um, also investment side and skills, because um, mm -hmm. well, these all new growing new sectors, uh, they will need also highly skilled or reskilled workers, and this is uh, something uh, that we have to well keep in mind. And, and then, of course, we will not end in isolation. We will accompany this competition angle, this very strong trade policy, mm -hmm. because we do have trusted partners, so we don't want to well, <laughs> uh, stop global trade. Uh, on the contrary, we celebrate uh, the situation where other market regions announce also their very ambitious investment plans, because the very moment when all of us are investing in low-carbon renewable mm -hmm. um, solutions, then we actually will meet uh, this, this um, challenge, um, how to cut CO2. Uh, so good that uh, other market uh, <coughs> participants um, in America, in Asia, are also willing to invest their taxpayers' money. So that brings costs down for all of us. Competition about uh, green finance is a good news. <laughs> it is good news yes. because, uh, because um, only 2019, mm -hmm. when uh, President von der Leyen announced that uh, this commission's flagship initiative will be Green Deal. Do you remember, this was not only about climate ambition, it was European growth strategy. So we initiated uh, these announcements. Uh, and on top of that, after this uh, Green Deal announcement, we were hit by COVID. Mm -hmm. And what was our um, reaction? It was next generation EU financing plan. Um, dedicated to twin transition, uh, digital and clean transition. So, so we were the leaders in this regard, that uh, clean also means growth. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Mr. La Camera, um, green hydrogen is one of the biggest topic about energy and industrial transition. Uh, green hydrogen, I think, is said to play a, a major role in the decarbonization for our energy systems. Uh, for this, we need investment in technology, green technology, and green infrastructures. So, what actions and investment are required now in order to facilitate um, good integration, uh, strong integration of green hydrogen and energy systems now in 2030 and beyond? So, thank you for this question that uh, allowed me uh, talking about green hydrogen uh, to come back uh, uh, on uh, the question uh, that uh, how to close the gap uh, between where we are and where we should have been if we were implementing correctly the Paris Agreement. So, we know that green hydrogen uh, will be one of, of the solution. Uh, but the solution uh, on how to have more green hydrogen into the market uh, belongs also to the question of how, how we can uh, accelerate the speed, the scale of the transition itself. Because uh, what I'm going to say is not applying only to green hydrogen, but it's applied to the transition uh, as, a, as a such. And uh, we will be repeating this message from now until COP28. So, in our point of view, there are two main uh, uh, shifts in our uh, way to look at uh, uh, the way we can accelerate the transition. The first one that we have been focusing until now on the supply. Do you remember Glasgow that was uh, cons uh, 
conceived as a sex or not success because uh, we use uh, facing out or facing still uh, facing down and still uh, or facing out. So as we were thinking that we can uh, face out coal or gas from the supply side, uh, this is not the reality. Hmm. The fact is that uh, today we have not enough demand for all the form of renewable energy. So the first uh, uh, argument also related to green hydrogen, because today we have not the demand for green hydrogen, in fact. So how to move the market and how to put in place the right policies to demand more renewable energy. The second aspect uh, that uh, we are going to focus is the following. You know, the actual uh, energy system is centralized and based on fossil fuel. It comes along more than one century. And uh, we have realized during the, the Afghanistan crisis that not only renewables are intermittent, but also gas is intermittent. <laughs> what uh, is making the difference between uh, the old system uh, and the new one coming, the old system has been uh, uh, growing together with the infrastructure that has been supporting it. So the physical infrastructure that make possible from the extraction point to arrive to my house and eating my house. The fact that we have built the, the legal and policy environment for making this system prosper. And we have uh, the, uh, our institution that has been built for that, Ministry for Petroleum and Gas. We have our professional career that was based on that. So now we have to change all this because renewables are not intermittent. The problem is that today we have not a system, physical infrastructure system, that works for making renewables, uh, to say, uh, engage fully in, uh, in the energy system. So the first is physical infrastructure. Second, legal, and I think we have heard what uh, uh, Europe is trying to do to have a legal environment that could facilitate. So market it how to, we design the market, etc. And we have been already talking about Europe on also the professional career, the institutional capacity. But think about Africa. Think about the Southeast Asia. How to transfer all this? So I think it's a question not only all analytical assessment, but it's also a question of common sense. How we can think that a company can go in Africa and invest if there is not a way to sell the electricity? because they don't, cannot plug the electricity into the grid. How we can make the tremendous power, powerhouse that is Africa for green hydrogen, if we have only an arbor in Namibia that now can provide some kind of uh, physical support for uh, uh, sending uh, ammonia to the European Union or to Germany. So the question of infrastructure is very critical in this respect. So, if we accept these two uh, very simple ideas, so focusing on demand and trying to understand what could be the infrastructure in the three pillar, in physical, legal, and institutional capacity and uh, professional career, what this could mean in different parts of the world, this will help also uh, us to rewrite the way the international cooperation works and why the international cooperation is failing. So, for example, concerning the physical infrastructure, we, cannot, we don't think that this could be done domestically. This could be not a, 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 a team for bilateral cooperation. I think that the multilateral financial system should be full engaged in building the physical infrastructure that is needed, giving priority to Africa and Southeast Asia. And on the other two pillar, bilateral cooperation, regional entity, Agency as, uh, as us, we can do the job for, uh, for uh, uh, making the legal environment, trying to build the career, et cetera. And we can say many things that we are undoing on that. So this is where we think, uh, and we want to send this message to support the, uh, the outcome of uh, the stock taking. Because naturally, uh, and, and we'll finish, the stock taking will say we are not on track, but yes, to say also how to close the gap. Because if we don't do that, there is no reason for having the UNFCC alive. So what we are trying to do is to build this narrative, and uh, we will keep informed our, our, our member states to try to, to be able 
to set how we can go beyond COP28 and make world, uh, the world uh, speeding up and the scale of its transformation toward the clean energy system. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. La Camera. Deep dialogue, deep dialogue, cooperation, multilateralism are the key words uh, about all the topics. El tiempo se acaba. Pero no sé si We're running out of time, but perhaps Ms. Teresa Rivera, Vice President Rivera, would you like to say a parting sentence? Well, I have to say yes. I have to say that the messages are out there. We need infrastructures, other skills, and there are very many elements which are tremendously attractive on the horizon. And all of this is what can actually be achieved on the basis of cooperation. We're talking about public-private partnerships, generating benefits as of day one, and making available opportunities for job creation and so on. So two years back, the world had a very different approach to the current uh, assessment of the energy challenge. That is true, but now we are in a position to really understand the granularity. This was unthinkable a few years ago, and this is what we need to aspire to. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to our speakers for your very interesting presentation. I hope this meeting, this conference, will serve to accelerate uh, speed and ambition of the energy transition. Nos va la vida en ello. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so very much. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Cristina. Thank you, thank you, Cristina. Thank you. Panelists, thank you. Thank you so much for all thank those. You so much. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you Queda to our claro panelists. I think it's very clear that this is an absolutely fascinating debate. debate. What a challenge. Sí, sí, oh, yes, please, please. Thank you. Y nosotros continuamos. Digo que queda and we'll claro continue. Que I was saying that these thoughts definitely allow us to understand the complexity that we face now and forward looking. We have understood very clearly after this conversation that there is not here, not during the debate, not during the transition, there is no magic wand, there is no three-step recipe. We saw in our video, in the video that uh, we cast at the beginning of the conference about renewables for people, we saw that Spain definitely has biodiversity that belongs to all. We're very, very lucky. Water, sun, the wind, all of us know. The forests and so many other natures of wonder that we are so very privileged to be able to enjoy. I think that I'm not exaggerating when I say that the energy we have is never-ending. And this is what we're going to see now. We have seen him perform. Hecha de sal de mar y ventisquero. We have Carne seen him perform. Fuego, con todos ustedes. El bailador Sand, Eduardo wind, Guerrero, premio Lorca, el mejor intérprete Eduardo Guerrero, masculino de Lorca danza flamenca Award, en 2022. Lorca Award, flamenco dancer, de la last year's winner, de Andalucía. Andalusian Award. El, With us today, eh, a la guitarra, Pino on Lozada. the guitar, Pino Losada. Ladies and gentlemen, Adelante, I hope you enjoy this.
Bravo, bravo, bravo. Qué maravilla. Bravo, gracias, bravo. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much to our two wonderful artists. Thank you. De las más this is energy, este I have to say. This is energy, too. Vamos a ir okay, esta so de we are coming to the end of our inauguration ceremony. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. We're talking about renewables. And I'm a journalist. I'm very interested in these issues. I certainly hope that this multilateral dialogue, which we will be witness to in the upcoming debates, the synergies that will doubtless result, I hope allow us to tackle jointly the challenge of successfully dealing with the energy transition. A change from one model to another. A model which was not good for the planet, which is not good for us who live here now and especially future generations, we want a more sustainable, a more equitable, a more justo future. So, thank you now, and off we go to a round table. We'll talk about energy, autonomy, this is a debate that keeps us very busy. Geopolitics is explaining to us how important security is. So we will be hearing from Teresa Rivera again, Vice President, Ministers Rob Jetten and Virgil Daniel Popescu, Ana Cubella, and with them, Henrik Andersen and Mariana Matsukato innovación y valor público de From la the University, University College of London, que nos acompañará con una intervención so, a través de la Invito, por favor, from, a todos uh, los Professor Matsukato via Zoom. Gracias Thank you. Nuevo. Please. Por favor, Thank you, ma'am. Yes, please. You join. Please join us here. Please. Gracias. Thank you. 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 Um, willing to join forces for a successful and speedy energy transition, favoring a, um, a greater role for renewable energy solutions. Before we um, start with this uh, conversation, I would like to introduce someone who pitifully has missed this opportunity, but wanted to send a message. My friend, our friend, Mariana Machucato, always ready to innovate um, on how to achieve uh, new issues, thinking on the moonshots that um, inspired uh, um, the whole approach that she's um, pushing forward from the academy. So uh, um, please, may we start with this short message that she has sent us? I would like to thank Deputy Prime Minister Teresa Rivera for this kind invitation. Apologies, I cannot be there with you. Every country in the world is facing an energy transition, which is challenging and actually unique in its own context. There's no one way to do an energy transition. But what is for certain is that it has to be treated with urgency and with seriousness in terms of actually redesigning our entire economy. It's not enough just to say that we need to invest in renewable energy. We must be investing in all new forms of uh, building, so construction materials, new ways to produce food and the agro industry, new ways to move, so sustainable mobility. Um, and at a moment where both Europe, the US, and other parts of the world are pumping trillions into our economies, it is more important than ever to make sure that this is not just about finance, not just about money, but it's truly about redesigning the economy to deliver on the goals of fighting for stopping global warming, but also all the different sustainable development goals, one could argue, have uh, a climate and sustainability uh, 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 aspect to it. So what I'm very interested in is how we can actually really think what is the new also capacity 
and capabilities that governments need in order to think about climate change at the center of how we redirect our economy. What does it mean for the training of our civil servants? What does it mean to think not about market fixing, so fixing different types of market failures, but actually actively shaping and co-creating a different economy? What does it mean for the tools on the ground? Every country, small, medium, and large, has, for example, a procurement budget, which is often one-fourth of the total government budget, and that can be green procurement. And thinking about things like green procurement really means that we also need to think not just at the ministerial level, but really think about the tools that government has for procurement grants and loans to create an alignment between all the different departments in government, to have an all of government approach using the levers on the ground like procurement to really catalyze the change. And in that particular case with procurement, it's of course a demand side tool, but there's also those supply side tools in terms of direct grants. And it's also about redesigning our institutions if we think of, for example, public finance institutions, public banks, the way that loans are provided can, you know, must be conditional on sectors proving that they're willing and able to create change. So recently, it was very interesting that the uh, German public bank, when it made a loan to the steel sector, that loan was conditional on the, the steel sector lowering its material content, which it ultimately did through using repurpose, reuse, recycle technology throughout the whole supply chain, causing, again, a catalytic and multiplier ripple effect uh, across the economy. So conditionality is linked to loans in order to you know, help those that are willing to move in the right direction versus just thinking in the old way of subsidies, loans, and guarantees to sectors just to stay in place. And ultimately, these conditionalities need to be at the center of a new social contract. This is about truly giving the word partnership uh, its true meaning, which is a good partnership. We shouldn't use the word partnership if it's a bad partnership. We need better metrics. Do we have symbiotic and mutualistic partners, uh, sorry, partnerships between the different actors in the government sector, in the private sector, and civil society? So what does that actually mean to become just as ambitious about the relational uh, uh, attributes of our ecosystems and not just looking at, say, ESG targets within companies. So I hope that some of these reflections about the new capabilities, the tools, the institutions, and the new social contract that we need for a green transition can be helpful for your conference today. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I, I, I could take um, some keywords and concepts. Redesign, partnerships, cooperation. So, how we can underline once and again and make reality this meaningful and powerful sentence that uh, security of supply, affordability, and clean solutions are things that come along together. It's not something that is in contradiction between um, among themselves, but uh, we can we can do these things in a in a smart manner. And to have a conversation around these ideas, um, it is my great pleasure to be joined by these uh, four fantastic leaders in renewable energy solutions. Rob Jetten, Minister of Energy of the Netherlands, Virgil Daniel Popescu, Minister of Energy of Romania, Anna Gubeya, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in Portugal, and the last but not least, Henrik Anderson, CEO of Bestas, one of the leading companies dealing with um, wind energy. I would like to start with uh, Rob, because talking about uh, redesigning new partnerships and building together, he's got a, um, a very deep experience in this 2022 20, year. We have worked together in the Council of Ministers of Energy, but also in the national reality, he has uh, been um, facing great challenges. In fact, uh, it is so impressive to see how the Netherlands has uh, moved uh, forward in the very last months, um, cutting off imports of Russian oil and natural gas and halving the import of Russian LNG in a very short period of time. So the um, main difficult question to raise to, to Rob would be what next? According to your experience in this 
like last and intense year. What could you uh, underline um, in terms of uh, cooperation to enhance energy security and the decarbonization of our agenda? Uh, thank you, Teresa, and thank you very much for, for having me here. I've been working with you very closely over the past year, and I'm quite happy to be in Madrid uh, today. Um, last year was a shake-up for all of us, and one thing that we've learned is that we can tackle both the energy crisis and the climate crisis at the same time. For the Netherlands, we've been over-dependent on fossil fuels and cheap fossil fuels from Russia. As you said, we've uh, gotten rid of all our Russian imports in just one year time, coal, oil, gas, uh, but it was a very drastic uh, a year for us. Um, we've cut our uh, energy use by 25%, so energy saving has been crucial to get through this winter. But we've also been able to double our LNG import capacity, not only supplying uh, Dutch industries, but also the industry in Germany and the Czech Republic. So European solidarity has also been uh, very crucial to us over the past uh, over the past year, and it's only been done because of uh, a government working closely together with companies and making sure that we deliver together. So market designs for that have been functioning for 10, 20 years weren't functioning in this crisis. Vulnerable consumers weren't protected. We couldn't deliver to a company. So we really uh, stuck together as a government and uh, companies. But we are now also speeding up the energy transition because replacing fossil fuels from Russia by fossil fuels from other parts of the world is something for the short term uh, in terms of uh, security of supply. But we're really picking up and speeding up the energy transition with massive investments in offshore wind, investments in green hydrogen, and the Netherlands is currently leading in solar PV. Um, our country with grey skies pa most part of the year is now number one in Europe and number two in the world. Hopefully Spain will catch up and uh, um, I'm really looking forward to, to sign a memorandum of understanding with you today because I want to ship the uh, Spanish sun to the Dutch harbour. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. I think that uh, it is uh, quite powerful to, to hear these messages of uh, strengthening cooperation and accelerating this, um, this transformation, something which is um, a, um, on the table of all of us. How, we can, how can we do a, um, this exercise in a successful manner and taking into consideration people and people's uh, needs? Um, including when thinking about consumers, industrials, and uh, households. And this is something which is also a challenge in every single country, including Romania. So my next question could go to uh, Romania, to Virgil Daniel Popescu, the Minister of Energy um, in Romania, to, to ask you about um, your own understanding on challenges and how to speed up the energy transition. What is the role for renewable energy in Romania? How uh, you feel that uh, we can play together and what are the main uh, needs and concerns that you have identified in your domestic process? So thank you, Teresa, for uh, inviting me here. We will work very hard this year, last year, in the Energy Council. We found solution together. We will remember that in August 2021 starts the hybrid war of the gas, of the price of the gas. Maybe at, the, at that time, nobody understand exactly what the Russian wanted to do it, but on 24th February last year, we already saw the results and we saw that we face a major challenge. We, we face, uh, we have the, gas, the security of the gas supply. So we were together and we finally succeed to pass this winter because even if it's winter now, we succeed to pass it. And we want to, to secure the next winter of uh, security of supply of the gas. Regarding uh, Romania, uh, first of all, I want to, to make a short presentation of the uh, ele electricity mix. We have coal, 18% of the total electricity producer is from coal. We have gas, 17% 17, of gas. We have nuclear, 20%, and we have hydro and renewables, that means 45% uh, of uh, uh, hydro and renewables, so uh, zero emission of carbon. And if we took in consideration of nuclear, because we are a nuclear country, we are a pro-nuclear country, we said that decarbonization without nuclear and electricity is very hard to achieve it. We, in Romania, have almost 65% of our total producer of electricity on low carbon. We assume 2032 phase out of coal. We put in our decarbonization law. We want to replace 
coal with, with gas as a transitional fuel. Why gas? Because we have resources of gas. Our natural resources of gas, we discover in the Black Sea, the big resources of gas, and we want to extract it and to use it inside. And after we extract the gas from the Black Sea, we can assure the security of supply of the region. We already assure the security of supply of Republic of Moldova, of electricity and also gas through the, the corridors that we already built in two years. If we look, we take in consideration 2019, we had, it, we had only one source of supply of gas, that was Russian Federation. Now we make all the connectivity and we can bring gas from Azerbaijan through TANAP, TAP, through IGB. Uh, we can bring from LNG uh, uh, terminals from Greeks and also from Turkey. So we develop a lot of terminals and we also build a pipeline that can uh, assure the security of supply from uh, the north country to Moldova. Yashun, Gen, Kishinev, and we can assure the security of supply of the Republic of, uh, of Moldova. Yes, we have big ambition. Till 2030, we want to build uh, 7 gigawatts of, uh, of renewables, uh, wind and uh, photovoltaic, without taking in consideration the offshore wind that we want to develop uh, uh, now. We are putting in place a framework. We want in this session parliamentary to approve it, uh, the offshore wind uh, law, in order to start the deployment and uh, the tender for uh, offshore wind uh, farms. We signed a memorandum, if you saw, in the presence of the President Ursula von der Leyen, with Azerbaijan, Georgia, Romania and Hungary, in order to have a green corridor between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, and to bring uh, uh, green electricity from, uh, from the Caspian Sea to, uh, to Europe. And uh, we also uh, have our own project in order to build from east, so, so from the Black Sea, to uh, the west of Romania, to the Hungary, and HVDC cable in order to transport uh, this electricity to, uh, to the Europe and also uh, uh, the electricity from the offshore wind and also from, uh, from nuclear. We want to be two more units of uh, uh, nuclear, units free and unit fraud on kind of technology. And also, as you know, we have an IGA with the United States to build a smaller modular reactor. And we find uh, uh, we already choose the, the site and we are in phase one of the contract of building small modular reactor. Uh, we choose already the technologies, a new scale one. So we have big plans. And uh, as we assume 2050 uh, net zero on, uh, on Romania, we have to be sure that till then we'll have uh, green uh, electricity and also uh, low carbon, uh, uh, low carbon uh, uh, electricity. We don't forget hydrogen. We have a strategy of uh, hydrogen in the National Resilience Plan. We are building, uh, pr produce, we have also line of finances through the resilience plans from producing, uh, producing hydrogen. And our TSO of gas now is uh, sinking to refurbish the, the major routes of transporting gas in order to uh, be ready uh, for hydrogen ready. So we want to be a hub of electricity in the region and a hub of gas and uh, mix of hydrogen in, in our region in order to secure the security of supply of the region and also of uh, uh, the center of Europe. Thank okay, you. thank you so much, Virgil. I think that um, you have a, a great agenda and a great work uh, forward. And I'm going to take two key words, uh, um, green corridors and offshore wind. Because um, if we partner with someone dealing with the green corridors and the energy transformation is with Portugal. And Portugal is one of um, these very brightest shining stars in the renewable energy map of the world. And now you have um, a, um, accelerated the deployment of offshore wind, which is uh, quite an interesting experience. And we would like to learn from you, um, Anna, uh, what are your expectations regarding the add value that offshore wind can bring into the energy transition and how you cope with the um, difficulties that sometimes this may, um, this may create, this may pose? So please, Anna, let us know a little bit more about your experience in Portugal. Yes, buenos dias, Teresa, and good morning to you all. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you. We have this very strong cooperation between Portugal and Spain that's very valuable to our citizens, uh, and I think it's also very valuable to Europe as a whole. So thank you very much for, for hosting me here today. Um, so energy security, as we have been discussing this morning, is about 
diversification of the energy mix. That's the key element, and each country needs to do it with its own endogenous resources. This, coupled with integrated markets, and the example of the green energy uh, corridor for energy is very important, uh, so this coupled with, with the integrated markets allow us to be more resilient, allow us to, to, to be able to achieve the security of supply that we were lacking just a few months ago. In this strategy for a country like Portugal and well for Spain, offshore wind plays a key role. It's very complementary to the solar projects that we have installed before and the potential, well, both in Portugal and in Spain, is indeed huge. To deploy it and to make sure uh, that, we, that we kick off the investments that we need, we need to balance two key dimensions. The first one is to provide certainty to investors. Investors need to, do, need to know what they can count on, um, and this means that we need to move fast to make sure that they have the certainty they need to deploy uh, their investment projects. At the same time, with this need for speed and certainty, we have to ensure that we um, have an open dialogue with local communities. This must be part of any strategy uh, to, to, to reindustrialize our countries. And that's why in Portugal, uh, we will uh, soon auction 10 giga of offshore wind, but right now what we are doing is a very intense preparatory technical work that uh, involves local communities, calls them into the process so that we can make sure that whatever we decide is in line with local interests, in line with national interests, and well, in line also uh, with the European in, uh, interest. So already this year, we'll, we'll start the first auction on this 10 giga of solar, um, and we will do it step by step also because technology is not yet mature. So it's a, um, basically, it's a balance that you need to find between the urgency to deploy the potential of offshore wind given its relevance for our, for our energy mix and at the same time ensuring, it, ensuring that you do it together with the local needs, together with the local uh, communities. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much. And certainly one of the key elements uh, to succeed, and um, we all agree on that, is this strong cooperation between private and, pub and public. Uh, and um, um, it is my pleasure to count on Henrik Andersen here, one of um, the pioneering companies in, in wind, uh, um, committed business people uh, to this agenda. Um, my question to you could be so easy that I ask you to to be short, because it is uh, something that uh, could take days and, and amounts to discuss. But what are your impressions on how to, to face and how we can uh, facilitate a very smooth transformation? What are you missing and what are the challenges when coming from uh, um, the public and the regulators, the public institutions and the regulators? What could you advise um, in this context? What, what do you think about this? First of all, first of all um, Teresa, can you hear me? Mm -mm. No. I hear you. Maybe now. Yeah. <laughs> Is that better? No. No? Yes? No. Yes, okay. Perfect. Teresa, thank you. Uh, we know each other throughout a number of years. First of all, because we were part of the pioneers in Spain. Uh, if we drive uh, approximately an hour and 45 minutes from here, we have one of our special uh, factories, which also manufacture blades and critical components to the wind industry. Um, I will also turn it differently and saying, public and private sector needs to get much closer together. We need to be less afraid of the red tape and how do we develop together? Uh, because in the past, and now I'm past, I always talk about the last five to 10 years, we all say we are in a hurry. We have all the right solutions. But let me also point to uh, Francisco Lacamar early on. It's going too slow. Um, and if, we, if, we, if that reminds us a little bit about the famous one with the white hair, Einstein, he defined insanity once, saying that keep doing the same 
and expect a different outcome. Um, and I think that's kind of where we are in this energy transition. We are talking a lot about it. We're talking a lot about getting it done, but it's not happening. And let me give you just a couple of facts because it's, it's famous to talk facts. EU had a target of putting renewable wind in Europe in 21 of 31 gigawatt, and we did 17. Yep. <laughs> in 2022, that number was 30 gigawatt, and we did 15. That's not half good. That is actually half disaster. Why? Because we still have 80 gigawatt stocked in permitting red tape. And today in Europe, it takes just around seven years to get from plan to get the actual energy capacity added to the grid. That is far too long. Imagine just the following, and I can't see your phone, Teresa, but I'm pretty sure you have a phone that is newest technology. When we are seven years under the way in permits and backlog, we take seven years, and at that point in time, it is the technology I worked with seven, eight years ago that is actually now being ad advanced in the permitting to the grid. So we need to shorten red tape, and we need to shorten the permitting. So transparent permitting forces also we can add capacity. And I hear a lot, I've always been asked, ah, but Henrik, are you sure you have capacity enough in Europe? I offered all in the local elections in Europe, I offered plenty of turbines. You can have them within a year. And no one have called me yet. <laughs> so so here, is, here is my question back. What is it private sector we need to give you of more assurance? Because the capacity is here. We can get it up very fast. And let me just maybe tease, uh, especially a couple of European politicians around here. Last year, the energy electricity price in Spain, average 365 days, was 168 euro per megawatt hour. Uh, in France, it was 276, so thank God we don't have any friends on the, pa the panel here. <laughs> Netherlands, it was 242, right? If you put new renewable capacity in, it's a clear sign that we lack capacity, we lack electricity manufacturing. We can do that at levels that are probably a fifth of those, but don't get too rust or too greedy into it. You had an auction in Spain that didn't go too well in Q4, was price limit 45. Maybe we need to go from 168 to 60 first and get the volume in because that will bring the overall price down. So I'm, from private sector, I'm really keen to work closely in understanding how we get the price levels down. Um, and now it seems, I can hear there was one uh, down here that says, hydrogen will solve everything. Uh, maybe. But there's one precondition to get hydrogen to work, that is enough electricity and plenty of it, but not at 242 euro per megawatt hour in Holland, because then hydrogen is not competitive mm. at all. Um, so I always need to say in panels, I'm a very, very positive person. I have two daughters and a wife, so I'm a very positive person. <laughs> but I sometimes comes across as a little bit frustrated and negative over things. But I'm passionate enough that we sit with the solutions, but we are not doing it enough and we are not doing it fast enough. So we are not doing enough, not fast enough. We need to do much more. Everything is positive, but we need to speed up. That's, that's <laughs> the main message. We are running out of time because this is a very intense discussion. But I, I would like to, to quote a little bit some of the surrounding elements. So to provide one minute slot for each one to make um, a comment, uh, taking into consideration what other references are important. Uh, we have been talking about interconnections being connected so to ensure that the complementarities can work. We have been working about how to speed up uh, in a cooperative mood and how to create an industrial value chain and to what extent this should be managed in a, in a way that benefits to all and not uh, create great champions, but the rest of the world is um, out, of, uh, out of business. So please let me know in one sentence, one minute sentence, uh, what additional 
strong message you want to leave in this room, because uh, we will keep on working these days, but it is very important to bear in mind what Hendrik has said, what you have commented on all the challenges, difficulties, but positive things too, and the surrounding elements that do create the conditions to push this agenda forward. Rob, please. Yeah, in one minute. Um, so in the North Sea region, we are the uh, big region where we use all the green hydrogen, but we also need a lot of green electrons to decarbonize our industry. The Netherlands will tender 21 gigawatts for offshore wind in the upcoming years, but the North Sea region will do much more. We are working hard on system integration and uh, interconnectivity so that all the North Sea countries work together to really speed up the process, cut red tape and really deliver in the upcoming years. But we won't be able to produce enough green electrons and green, green molecules for the Northwestern uh, industry. So we also need Spain and Portugal to become our main suppliers. So in this year, we will work very closely together to set up a maritime corridor. Obviously, I'm very happy that new pipelines are being planned between Portugal, Spain, France and Germany. But in the short term, in just a few years time, we also need the shipping routes and we will deliver on that in just three years time. Okay, uh, Virgil. So, yes, hydrogen, hydrogen is the, the, the fuel of the future, but we have to have extra capacity of producing electricity, renewables and low carbon. As I said, Romania is a, a nuclear, a pro-nuclear country in order to have that affordable uh, hydrogen. And also we have to think and uh, uh, to make route of transport of security of supply of hydrogen uh, because uh, now I think we have to, to learn from the lesson of the past that uh, uh, we have to assure our hydrogen producing, produce hydrogen in, uh, uh, in Europe and in democratic country in order not to face the same things that we face now, or that we already faced with the gas used as a, as a political weapon. Thank you. So we're speeding up uh, permitting and um, the industrial value chain. Anna, what do we say? Well, uh, on my end, I would like to say that this is the time for us to grasp the opportunity to reindustrialize our countries. We cannot miss this opportunity. This is really the time. Uh, countries like Portugal and Spain, uh, we do have a reliable green energy and this is uh, a very important competitive advantage that can play a role not only in our countries but also in Europe. We do have uh, safety uh, and stability, regulatory stability. The changes that we have been doing, of course, were changes that were much needed and now we can provide certainty to the market. We have the skills and we are investing in training. Both our governments are very keen on ensuring that we develop the skills that we need for this transition to, to happen. And well, we have the infrastructure or we are building it, um, uh, interconnection, port infrastructure for sure. Uh, all of these will, will, will ensure that we are able to build in our countries the industries of the future. Thank you so much. Fluent dialogue, strategic uh, partnerships, um, open uh, uh, strategic autonomy and green industry as uh, main factors for uh, um, the economic um, development of the European Union um, industry. Hendrik, what an additional message you want to leave, because we have taken note of what you have already <laughs> said. Yes, what no, but I, but, I, but I think here also, I think we are all consumers as part of it. And I really welcome the electrification because actually the electrification, I have an electric car, not surprised, but that now holds three to four days of transportation. Mm -hmm. And one day, part of this, we will see the demand changing rapidly. Electric cars has gone from 2% of the new sales to suddenly north of 15% uh, last year. That also means that if we look at it, we will have a different usage and storage of our renewable energy, which actually gives us more advancement and more positive from the technology development. So for me, technology development together with the local corporation, and then maybe I should tease uh, all of you in the end, make sure your local demand for renewable in your country is as easy to get to and don't fall into the six years trap. Okay, thank you so much. A long list of to-do things um, that show to what extent this is not anymore a primary a, uh, dreaming conversation, but a very serious and um, a, uh, racing up a um, reality that uh, goods uh, that goods uh, uh, require 
uh, additional efforts from the side of all of us. So thinking in a different manner, but also working intensively to transform the reality in the good uh, direction and at the right speed. Taking into consideration all the positive add values that each of us can provide. So thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts and ideas. We will keep on discussing and working, not only discussing <laughs> in this in these fields with um, all all our friends in the room and behind the um, the cameras behind the screens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. This was a debate with ideas, proposals for thoughts and action. Before going over to the next panel, we ask to Mr. President Long, Vice Minister of the Government of the Popular Chinese Republic. Your Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Rivera, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my great honor to attend the conference and speak at session on behalf, behalf of the National Energy Administration of China. Accelerating renewable energy development and tackling climate change has become a global consensus. More than 130 countries have set ambitious net zero or carbon neutrality goals to implement the Paris Agreement. In September 2020, Chinese President Xi Jinping announced that China strives to peak CO2 emission by 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. China has been, has been optimizing its energy mix and developing the fossil energy sources. In 2022, wind and solar PV have become the main source of China's newly installed capacity as well as China's newly added electricity generation, accounting for 78% and 55% respect, respectively. By 2022, China's total installed capacity of renewables exceeded 1,200 gigawatt, generating 2,700 terawatt on Earth of electricity in the year. It equals to reducing 2.3 billion tons of CO2 emission. There is no one size fits all path to net zero or carbon neutrality. Each country needs to find the solutions suited for its conditions. With China's experience, the following aspects are key. First, while balancing energy security and uh, energy transitions to ensure steady transitions facing out conventional energies can all, only happen when their substitution by renewable energy is uh, reliable and uh, in place. Since 2022, many countries have adopted more flexible and uh, Real, realistic energy policies. It pro proves that in order to safeguard energy security, it's vital to keep a steady pace of transition and uh, give a full play to our energy sources. 
Second, accelerating the R&D and application of clean energy technologies. We should work hand in hand to create an open, fair, just, and non-discriminatory environment for technology development. To scale up application of new technologies and reduce their costs. We should adhere to market principles, promote the free flow of technologies and equipment. If we take a look at the global CO2 emission reduction through renewable energy utilization in 2022, we may find 40% of the equipment are made in China. Third, boosting investment in clean energy. Government should further support R&D of technologies and market development and formulate policies to attract more social capitals into the clean energy sector. In particular, more importance should be attached to increasing financial support to developing countries in order to unlock their huge market potential and promote energy access and just transitions. Fourth, strengthening international cooperation on renewable energy amid the ranging torrents of an, any global crisis countries are not riding in their own small boats. Rather, we are all in a giant ship with a shared destiny. Therefore, we must take concerted efforts and enhance collaboration. China is calling for building a global clean energy partnership, and we welcome all countries and international organizations to join and cooperate to the full range and at multiple levels to give full play to clean energy in leading global energy trans transitions. Today, we are honored to have a distinguished guests with us in the round table and share their valuable insights. I look forward to their excellent discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, the different participants of the next panel, high level panel, to reach the decarbonization. Then. Sarah Atkinson, Secretary of Gen uh, Energy, for the demographic, demographic debate. As a debate, we have Heike Zen, Director of Energy of the Ministry of Cooperation from the Federal Government of Germany. Paul Hedersey from the Department of Australia del Sur y Maria Neira. Maria Neira, Director of Public Health, Climate Change and Environment of the World Health Organization. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much for for this very good this introduction. I would like to let you know that finally Mohave ben, ben Yahya couldn't attend this meeting, so it's a pity, but we have an excellent panel today with us. Um, el panel de hoy va a versar sobre panel today we deal about how to reach the net zero, how to be able to obtain with different actions that goal that we had set in Paris. And that very important goal in order to obtain multiple core benefits, especially due to the urgency and the need of acting against the climate change. Good morning, excellencies, when delegates, colleagues and friends. Um, we are facing unprecedented challenges, with, um, uh, which they are very diverse, but also I think there are many, they have many things in common. We are at a turning point when we talk about energy transition, the global commitment to climate change, this net zero scenario, the possibility of uh, maturity of different technologies, competitiveness, reduction of uh, external dependencies, the new industrial age, the cost, social co-benefits of this energy transition. 
these are different elements that are driving governments, but also companies, private sector and civil society to accelerate the deployment of renewable energies. In this sense, I want to share with you that Spain is very proud to be hosting Spirec 2023 as part of our commitment on this acceleration of energy transition at home, but also worldwide. In this session, which closes this morning program for the first day of Spirec 2023, we want to look at the intersection of the short run, short term challenges that we are facing. We are talking about COVID, we're talking about this invasion of Ukraine, the crisis in the energy sector, with the long term goal that means net zero. I'm sure that all of us are aware of health tensions, crisis. We have Maria here. Uh, we also have tensions in the supply chain, the war, the cost of living crisis, inflation. And all of this make us rethink about what are the roles of the role of governments, obviously, but international organizations and private sector on what role they can play and how we collaborate in a different manner to make things well. I also want to stress the message that um, is delivered every year by the Global Risk Report. I think it's a very important report uh, provided by the World Economic Forum. And let me stress just one main message. The main risk we face as a society, both in the short run and in the long run, it's the failure to mitigate climate change. I believe we have now a huge opportunity, and the opportunity is that short run and long run need to be aligned. Both need the same response. That means we need to speed up the energy transition. Even though this is apparently uh, so obvious, there are lots of reports, the last one from the International Energy Agency, saying that if we are still facing a huge, significant gap when we talk about ambition, but also when we talk about investment. So, uh, this is the main topic I think we need to discuss in this very interesting session. Let me introduce our distinguished panel. Um, I have uh, close to me Heike Hen, Director for Climate, Energy and Environment at the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Welcome. Uh, we also have Paul Hederset, Chief Executive of the Department of Energy, Mining, Government of South Australia. Thank you and welcome. It's a long journey from <laughs> Australia to Spain. And last but not least, uh, obviously, we have Maria Neira, Director of Public Health and the Environment Department at the World Health Organization. So, well to, welcome to, to you all. And the first question, the obvious one for this session is, how can we best bridge the ambition and investment gaps? Who wants to jump in? You want me to start, Sara? That's great. Good. Okay, thank you very much, and so pleased to be in this beautiful country, which by coincidence is my country too. <laughs> let, let me, let me uh, tell you how we can reach more ambition. Maybe this is a, a vision which is a little bit biased, obviously, but I think the health argument is the one that can help you all to reach more ambitions. Why the health argument? Because it's a non-controversial. Because people will be aligned around all of that. Because it's the one that will talk to all of us. If we use the health argument, we can accelerate this transition, we can scale up on a very ambitious way, and we can probably go on a, on a different speed. Uh, Francesco La Camera was uh, talking about the how slow we are doing this transition. I think if we, if we start to explain our citizens, our people, that this transition is not only fair, but is the transition that will generate enormous benefit for our health. And the, 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 the health argument is about reducing 7 million premature deaths we have every year due to exposure to air pollution, air pollution that is caused by the combustion of fossil fuels. So it's already a very strong argument. Second, we will reduce all of this suffering and all of the chronic diseases from asthma to OCD, OCPD, uh, obstructive chronic pulmonary diseases, all type of uh, diseases that are chronic that are costing as well to our health system, 
a lot of finance and a lot of uh, resources that are normally not included in all the benefits that you were describing before on why we need to have this uh, uh, transition. So I think we need some positive stimulus and the health argument can be the one for us. Access to renewable energy is the way to reduce all of those chronic diseases dramatic diseases and deaths that we are accumulating everything because of the exposure to air pollution, one of the, the benefits. In addition to that, if you accelerate the, the mitigation of climate change, the benefits for our, for our health would not only be on the cleaning the air we breathe, but as well on, on a more sustainable way of living uh, in our cities and our urban environment, better uh, conditions for all of us, and of course, more sustainable food systems, which will generate more benefits. So I think we need to start to talk uh, in, in health language, and that can be very motivating for our population to engage and to join this transition that is so much needed. Thank you very much, Maria. I totally agree. I think we need to provide the adequate message to all the civil society to know that this is something that we need and what are all the positive co-benefits that we will deliver. Um, Heike, do you want to add something on, on this? Yeah, happy to follow up on this positive note because I think, uh, Maria, both of you are totally right. We need a positive vision while um, acting based on facts. And therefore, this, the facts bring the urgency. Uh, this is the decisive decade. Um, but we need really a positive vision. And just following up briefly, the health issue is clear, but also uh, the security um, energy owned by people also in a very decentralized way. And also from a private note, I can tell you, a solar rooftop can tell you exactly when you're 20 year old, uh, enters the house and is hungry. So you have total control, not only of your energy resources, but also of your family. But just on a side note, I think a positive vision is key to act, but also I think in these decisive times, we need multilateral action to make this happen in the scale we need it. Uh, cooperation, transparency and coherence in what we talk and what we do nationally and also internationally and globally. I mean, I'm, I'm very sorry that our colleague from Morocco couldn't make it because I think sharing apart from the European perspective and the Australian, the global perspective is also key. And we have many colleagues here in the room from Asia, from Africa, from different, from Latin America. And the global challenge is not only getting emissions down, but achieving development for those 730 people that have not access to energy now, or the more than 2 billion people, mostly women, who have not access to clean cooking energy, and talking again to the health aspects. And therefore, we, we have to have a positive vision um, that includes development for those uh, regions that uh, have yet to prosper and build in industries. And therefore, we need multilateral action. And uh, let me maybe uh, give one last point, partnerships that aim for ambition. Uh, we, from the German uh, perspective in our G7 presidency, try to foster ambitious partnerships, just energy transition partnerships to get out of coal faster, but also energy partnerships 100% access to energy with 100% renewables, for example, for um, least developed countries in Africa. So f find new and creative ways of acting together is a way forward from my perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I totally agree. Once again, I think scale is an important word, but development, it's a huge word that we need to use in collaboration. Um, Paul, I don't know if you... Yeah. Want you add something else on, on this very general question that I put on the table? So first, first of all, thanks for in, inviting us. Um, I come from South Australia, which is a sub-national jurisdiction in sort of central southern Australia. And I just think it's worth uh, just reflecting on our journey to partly answer the question, because currently South Australia uh, has 70% renewables in, in, in its state, and that's happened, we were 100% fossil fuel 15 years ago, now we're 70%. And so we've advanced very, very quickly, um, and we think we're now the largest uh, 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 
uh, have the highest proportion of renewables for a, for a gigawatt scale grid in the world now. Um, now, South Australia is, as I say, a southern, southern central state. It's geographically large. It's a uh, couple of times bigger than Spain. Most of the people live on the coast and we have large areas of, of uh, uh, arid land, which gives us a, a, a technical advantage in, the, in as much as we have the wind and the solar resources intrinsically there. And I think this is part of the question, is where are the resources fundamentally that you're going after? Uh, and that does then point to Australia, South America, Africa. That's a, different, that's a slightly different paradigm than the one we've been used to. Um, we've, we've, also, we've also had the situation where we've had our own series of crises, and in, in politics they often say, don't, don't waste a good crisis. So in South Australia in 2016, we had a system black, a total blackout of our grid, and that propelled our government at the time to say, all right, we have to go much, much harder on renewables than we ever did before. And so within a few weeks, uh, the Cabinet, who uh, really uh, educated themselves on energy and power systems and, and, and options, and invested, uh, came up with a new energy plan, which actually, uh, and we built the first uh, large-scale battery, the Hornsdale battery from Elon Musk and Neo uh, and And uh, that, was, that was built in six months. Uh, nobody thought it could be done. The regulations weren't in place, but it was because of the urgency of the problem. And now the learnings from that particular uh, exercise are being replicated all over the world, the way the services go. So I think having a... Having, a, having, having the resources in the first place is really very important. Where are they and how do you get there? I think political leadership, which was the case in our case, we have, we've had bipartisan support the whole way through. And so now uh, the current government is investing uh, almost $600 million in a hydrogen, green hydrogen power plant. So we've heard a bit of debate about is hydrogen going to be the fuel, fuel of the future? Well, the government in South Australia is taking a big bet that it is. And the, the interest we're getting from around the world to partner up with us on that is nothing short of extraordinary. So I think political leadership, having the right resources, having the policy settings in place, and having a community that behind, is behind you as well, because one of the issues that will come up that we find now and will happen in other jurisdictions is you need to have what we call a social licence to operate. Um, you know, you can't assume the public is always, is always going to be with you and you can't take that for granted. So. I think they're the things. Urgency, having the resources in the first place and political leadership above all else. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you to share this uh, very um, positive experience that you are facing in, in, in South Australia. Thank you very much. And now, um, jumping once again in, uh, to Maria. Maria, uh, you have a huge experience in the WHO. I think it's very important you were mentioning the link between net zero and health. But can you elaborate a little bit more of um, how important is achieving this net zero for, for health? Thank you, Sara. Again, it's extremely important. Remember, years ago, uh, it was absolutely impossible to talk about health without access to safe water or safe food. Mm -hmm. Well, today, it's exactly the same for safe sources of energy, clean sources of energy. It's fundamental for our health. When you go to uh, South Africa, South Africa, no, Sub-Saharan Africa, sorry, you will see that in each health uh, healthcare facility, 50% of them will not have electricity. So how can you perform a, a minimum uh, medical care or a minimum uh, infection prevention or, or providing a vaccine or having a refrigerator to keep a vaccine or helping a woman to deliver in the night if you don't have electricity? And, and I saw it myself, but unfortunately even today you have one billion people around the world that when they go to a healthcare facility, they do not have reliable energy at that healthcare facility. The only solution, renewables. Less dependence, available, less cost, it's, and for us, is the only way today, in a way that I still don't understand why we are not having all our healthcare facilities in Africa, for instance, with solar panels. It's something that I don't understand because my colleagues from Irina and others are telling me that the prices are going down, the technology is very simple now. So we are now launching this huge project to electrify with renewable sources of energy healthcare facilities. So that will help us to reduce an important health negative impact of the use of fossil fuels. The second one will be, of course, the fact that 
the combustion of fossil fuels generate air pollution. Mm -hmm. All of those pollutants are coming into our lungs mm -hmm. and we need to breathe air that will not kill us. I'm not saying that we go to the Swiss mountains where I live and then we have this quality of the air. I'm not asking so much. I'm asking air that is not toxic, that is not responsible for lung cancer, for all the diseases that we are seeing now and for which our communities are paying. So when we use this language of uh, we don't have the resources to invest on renewable sources of energy, you are already paying for because your hospitals are already paying the, the cost of all of those chronic diseases. So for us, it's fundamental to accelerate this access to clean sources of energy, affordable, modern, because the health of the people will depend. When, when you see um, renewables and then the winds and, and you, have, you see photovoltaics, I see lungs. And, and, <laughs> I, and I see lungs that are inhaling all of those horrible toxic uh, uh, combustant uh, uh, residues that are going to my lungs. And from the lungs, they can go everywhere in our body. And that is why we see all the diseases that we see at the moment, including affecting our brain. Our brain is affected by exposure to air pollution. Maybe this is the reason that we are not smart enough and we are not accelerating enough. So let's correct that as soon as possible. Muchas gracias, Maria. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for that, Maria. Thank you very much. I have to acknowledge that when I see um, wind farm or um, PV, I, I see a smile because I think that's part of the solution for the challenge. I don't see lungs, but I think I'm going to start seeing lungs like you. And I do think that, of course, clean air is so important. Hickey. you, you have a lengthy uh, experience on cooperation and collaboration and partnerships with all countries. Can, you, can the international development partners breach this ambition gap and this uh, investment gap? And how does your government, Germany, um, what is doing to support these other countries that need uh, a lot to, to be part of this uh, decarbonization pathway? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I mean, our objectives we can only achieve globally, and therefore the ministry I'm working is dealing with development. And uh, we aim to support uh, partner, partner countries. And exactly, I think, the three points that uh, um, Paul was um, pointing out. Partner countries that have the political will, that uh, want to bring the policies in place we need to give the direction to all stakeholders and then uh, support in the financing part. And uh, right now, I mean, BNZ uh, is uh, providing um, the most bit of the international climate finance from Germany. And we have uh, partnerships on energy with almost 30 countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America. And uh, um, committed only last year almost 4 billion euros. So it's a really a vast portfolio where a lot of support is going then in implementing the policies with the infrastructure mm. and uh, the planning, but also the analysis and the capacity that is needed uh, because it's a system change. You need the grid uh, um, but, and you need the renewables, you need the storage, but you need also the people mm. and their capacity. But this is uh, what comes from all the partners in the room and we from the um, development side only cooperate. And maybe if you allow me this one remark, where we are already uh, now very active, uh, talking about multilateral action. Um, our system as it is right now, the financial system, is not fit for purpose for um, providing for the global public goods that we all need globally. And therefore, we need to think differently. Uh, we, try, we need to reorganize how we finance and how we look at risks and how we um, then mobilize financing. Mm. The greatest risk is the climate crisis. Mm. It's not loss of an investment in renewables in Burkina Faso. And to make our system, our multilateral joint system fit for these kind of risk perception is, I think, uh, one of our key priorities. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Paul, 
going back to you, South Australia is a global leader in the energy transition, as you mentioned, you are doing a lot in, in the last years. Mm. And congratulations, because you are the first national go government member of IREC, of RAIN21, so congratulations for that, very good <laughs> news. But also we have another good news, is that South Australia's capital city, Adelaide, is going to be the host of 2024 International Renewable Energy Conference. So that, that, that is very important issue and will be next year. Yeah. Do you think that the main topics that we are discussing uh, during this session, this, uh, this conference in Madrid, will be the same, will be at the center of the debate next year? Mm -hmm. What kind of themes do you think we will have um, on top of the priorities uh, in, in your case? I think uh, one of the, uh, well, first of all, welcome to everybody to come to South Australia. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, Adelaide itself is a city and it's surrounded by uh, vineyards on all three sides and the sea uh, to, the, to the west, so it's a very pleasant place to come and visit. And we have some strange animals there that you might be interested in seeing when you get there. But, uh, but we're very pleased to have uh, IREC coming to Adelaide next year. And I think one of the, the themes that, that people will find there is it, it, we're part of Oceania, we're part of the Southeast Asian, North Asian block, and uh, the, the needs and desires for Japan, Korea, China is, uh, is very interesting and, and a bit different to the, the discussions we've been having here. You know, uh, uh, but again, we're related in the sense that we've, there, there, there is a climate emergency, uh, and, 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 and of course, it, it, uh, South Australia is the sort of driest, cont the driest state in the driest continent, and so the effects of climate change are real and apparent to us right now. It, it's similarly the same for our Pacific Island friends who will be at this conference as well. So I think that you'll have a slightly different uh, lens to look at uh, the issues that we've got. But the, the notions of oh, how do we move investment faster, how do we set up regulations, I think, that are, I think that's really important. And we are actually trying, we, we will be legislating a, a new piece of legislation mid-year called the Hydrogen Renewable Energy Act, and it's a one-stop shop for anything for large-scale renewables. And I think there's some lessons to be learnt uh, for all jurisdictions if we can get this right. And we are you know, quite... Uh, uh, happy to pinch ideas from Germany and, and the way they've done some of the, the expedited some of their regulations. So I think that will be, be an interesting discussion to have as well. Okay, thank you, Paul. Hopefully we will have a very successful result at COP28. So this will be part of, of the input for, for that conference next yeah. year. Yeah. Cost of action, it's much lower than cost, cost of inaction. That's, that's obvious, is in every report and from academia, even from international organizations. But action is not enough for the time being. What do you think is happening? Is the model of cooperation is not well enough? It's uh, the political will? Is the private sector what we need? It's because of the timing, because we are thinking in the storm run and we need to think in a long-term view? I don't know. What, what, what is your feeling about what is happening? why the action is not happening and the speed and the need we need, we, we need to fulfill net zero. Paul? Yeah, please. No. <laughs> it's not that I have the silver bullet, um, but I mean, to be fair to all decision makers, it's quite a complex mm. situation we are in. And uh, like I think Francesco, you said, uh, we are working within an existing system and having said that, I mean, the fossil system didn't deliver in a fair and equitable way for yeah. everybody globally. And, and we have to acknowledge the fact and really turn around and need, have the political will and, and, and be coherent in, in what we are doing. Uh, because then everybody gets the right signal to invest, to act in the household. Um, so, and, and right now, um, we are not coherent enough. Mm. Um, but uh, let me say this also, um, in the crisis we have been discussing this morning, um, and Germany is also a question sometimes on what we are doing this year, but we stick firmly to our climate goals. We increased our share of renewables and we stick to having 80% of renewables in the grid by 2030 and being net zero, the topic of this session, by 2045. So have a clear objective and act coherently. I think this is what we also as citizens have to ask of all our governments. That's right. One thing I'd like to add is I think 
one of the things we're trying to do as a government is, de is de-risk the, the investment decision. You still need the market signals. You still need, to, need them to be as transparent and as clear as you can. But there's a lot governments can do to do risk through regulation, through planning. And one thing we haven't talked about very much is, is, is engaging our First Nations people. And that's a very important part of our, the Australian experience. That, and what we're trying to do in South Australia is, is engage, they're, they're the first people we've engaged with with this new legislation. And I think that's really important. That, because that's another, it can be, it can be it's, it's a, perhaps it's a risk on one side, but it's a big opportunity for Aboriginal people to participate. And they're very keen to do so. So I think that's a, that, that will be a really important point. Okay, thank you, Paul. Maria. Uh, you know, I think it's the, the question as well of, uh, this is irreversible, no way to go back. I think everybody is in agreement from the government top level to the, the citizens, this is irreversible. Mm -hmm. The question is the speed and the level of ambition. When do you want to do it? So probably what we need to do a little bit more is to align our messages. Uh, I think we need to create a very positive alignment of what we are trying to build here. And, and maybe, again, telling the citizens why this is important for them. And, and it's not just the agenda of environmentalists or even people from the health sector or even people from the energy sector. This is the agenda and the, the mission we need to really change the way we live and we will survive and have a better life. And on that, I think the narrative needs to be a little bit clearer and using positive messages that will engage people. The moment our citizens will put pressure on our politicians with all the respect for the politicians, I think the speed will be accelerated. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but for that, they need to understand that this is uh, fundamentally important for them as an individual. So maybe we need to work on those messages, why this, as an individual, this is good, good, uh, good for me and not just for the planet, for the environment. Sometimes I think we focus too much on distant things, the, the, the polar bills, the, 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 the glaciers. Mm -hmm. No, my lungs and, and it's today and it's the asthma of, of my nephew, my son. So I think that language can create a more positive, engaging, motivating narrative with all the enormous positive benefits that we can obtain as a society. Muchas gracias, María. Mensajes cercanos y claros. Well, thank you very much. Messages that are close up and that um, allow us to understand how important it is to do something. Just to finish, can you tell me one word that we need to achieve net zero? Yes, one word. It's one of you. Heike. Being just, uh, addressing specifically women and vulnerable groups. Thank you. Paul. I, th I think uh, in our case, uh, bring First Nations people on with, for the ride and see, to see them get advantage out of this as well. And Maria? I will put lungs <laughs> big. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and please join me in a big applause to this excellent panel today. Thank you. And hope you can enjoy the rest of the Spire 2023 here in Madrid. Thanks, thanks very much. Bye. Well done. Con esta mesa redonda terminan las sesiones de alto nivel del día de hoy. This is the end of today's round sessions. Lunch will be served now in the main hall. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.